Sometimes I find it really hard to talk about certain subjects, you know, that, oh, things that people get into, you know, that they, they kind of like feed on, you know, they like, oh, they get their emotions wound up about, you know, right now the current buzz is, oh, you know, the undead, you know, there seems to be this fascination with vampires and <laughs> the undead and they keep making movie after movie after movie of this, you know, <laughs> taking over the world kind of thing. And, you know, the one lone survivor, you know, it's kind of a survivalist mentality that there's a popular craze or we used to say goth, you know, or, or, or kind of like a, a return back to the days of, oh, the dark ages when Europe was caught up in the plague and they didn't really understand about disease, so they blamed everything on it being demonic and everything on it being somehow supernatural. And as it turned out, it was rats with <laughs> fleas that had, you know, plague-infested viruses. And, you know, we still have that today. As a matter of fact, they say that in New York, there's a the potential for the pubonic plague to break out at any time because there are rats there with fleas that have the plague and they can't completely eliminate them. But this fascination with the occult or with certain ideas about the occult was prevalent in the Middle Ages. Was That, that was a time when a lot of people thought they knew and didn't know what they were talking about. And that's why I don't get real excited about when God has a devotional about kind of satanic things or about the enemy or the devil or stuff because people seem to want to get into it, you know. But there's also now a prevalency to forget about it, you know. And there was a TV show that was like, you know, somehow made demons into good guys, you know. And that's obviously wrong and there's a worship of angels going on you know sometimes among people that even the the Jewish nation had a problem with that that a lot of the the common people tended to kind of look up to angels you know and Paul had to address that in the book of Hebrews that though there's a lot of people that were Jewish that worshiped angels he addressed it pretty factually and said hey you know Jesus is a little more important than an angel. <laughs> and sometimes our attitude and our actions reflect what we're really interested in. And I hope you're not one of those that are like caught up into this whole new craze of, oh, I got to get some supernatural fix or, oh, I got to go check out this miraculous happening or, oh, I got to go see the gold dust or, Ooh, I gotta find out what Satan's doing. You know, that's stupid. If you really want to get excited about something, imagine if God took you right now out of your body into heaven so you can see the heavenly scene. Read the book of Revelation because that's what it's like. And then begin to imagine what if God took you there, like Paul? What if God wanted to reveal himself right now and said, hey, check it out. I'm going to show you my glory. And then he just opens up the doors of heaven and you are transported out of this body, maybe in it, you don't know. And you're there in the heavenly scene and you see things that are too miraculous to even talk about. So you don't come back and tell everybody and write a book about it and say, I spent five minutes in heaven or five minutes in hell. You know, don't go there. You know, the sensational and the extra miraculous or whatever you want to call it isn't what God was all about Jesus was real he walked from day to day to day to day all through this life and he did things that were quite frankly normal for a person walking in the spirit 
You want to heal somebody, walk up, ask God to, and if God says yes, then do it. If you want to cast out a demon, walk up somebody, and if God says to. Don't just walk up and do it. Because if you do, you didn't do it. You probably got deceived. You probably got lied to, and you think you did something. And it was just a deception to set you up for something, a bigger fall later in your life, that you're going to fall flat on your face. And Satan will laugh at you. You know, and you might have a hard time getting back up from that kind of a fall. And there are evangelists and ministers and men of God that do that all the time. You know, they they get caught up in their own excitement or joy over whatever it is they think they have. And they haven't balanced it out with talking to God on a daily basis. And so they set themselves up for a big fall. And we've seen lots of ministries do that. You know who they are. You've seen how it happens. But there is a truth about the devil and all his angels that hell and the lake of fire has been prepared for them. Is that they shall be cast into that eternal damnation, eternal judgment. And all those that participate with it, that obsess themselves for it will be cast there too because if you don't have Jesus in your life if you don't have the living God literally in you as first John says then you're going to get caught up into these ideas about all these other subjects and you're going to get distracted away from the reality of Jesus himself the one focus of your life and that's what it should be because whether it be political or social or business or work or family or health or wealth or prosperity or poverty, all of these distractions will take you away from starting your day with God and ending your day with God. Because in between you may get you know kind of distracted at times, you may go off on tangents, but that's to be expected. But you know, there's a, another way that God said to resist the devil and his demons. There's another way that God said to not be caught up in the overblown ideas that people have about prophecy, about healing, about health, about wealth, about political ideas, about social ideas, about news, about end times, about... <laughs> about everything and that's have a friend you know Jesus stuck his disciples together two he sent them out two by two you know and that way they could see together and analyze understand look at and evaluate the circumstances and the situations that they were in they didn't act as independent agents going out and doing their own thing and you know, separate, but they worked together cooperatively. They were able to see, to hear, and to understand what the will of the Holy Spirit was. So, in that respect, learn something from the scriptures. You know, when you see these people, you know, kind of going off alone and telling you things maybe look at what jesus did you know and how jesus was you know take someone with you that you trust or that you share with or that you care about and that they care about you and begin to have kind of like an agreement about hey you know this seems a little weird what do you think we should do and begin to work with the person that you think would be like your Barnabas or your Paul or someone that you can grow with. Now it may not be for the rest of your life because obviously in the world we live in sometimes people, friends, tend to go different directions and that's okay. But then when you do, find someone else. So that way when you run into things that you don't understand, maybe that other person does and if you bounce off each other the ideas, you might come up with some different conclusions than getting wrapped up in your emotional response to something that the other person might not be so emotionally responding to. In other words, sometimes, you know, since Jesus said it, where two or more are gathered, there I am in the midst. 
when Jesus is with you, you really have three. So the fact that three are going, you kind of fulfill that promise that says, my word is established in the presence of two or three witnesses. Well, to put it bluntly, you got you, you got the other person, and you got Jesus. That's that's a pretty good witness, you know. And his word could be established to you for just as simple as having one other person there that you can share with or care with. They don't have to be a BFF, but they should be a GFF. God's favorite friend. <laughs> when two agree, if two of you shall agree, I am the truth. Every word of mine is true, and every promise of mine shall be fulfilled. First, gather together in my name, bound by a common loyalty to me, desirous of doing only my will. Choosing a person, you know, to be that kind of Christian friend, CFF, <laughs> is a matter of looking, evaluating, and taking the time to get to know the person and then saying to them why you want to be together. You know, I would like to study with you. I would like to learn from you. I'd like to grow with you. What, what do you think? Would you like to make this commitment together, you and I, to walk this road that we're on? And I think you'll find that if you don't take for granted that someone wants to, but you actually go out of your way to make it that specific, you're going to get what you ask for. Because a lot of times people kind of go along with each other just because they're lonely or they have a peculiar need. But when you really want to get to the heart of the matter, be open and honest, be sincere and true. It's kind of like, you know, when you go on a job, you know, you if you've ever been in business and you have a contract, you sit down and you talk about it. You, you go to a job and you say, this is what you want and this is what I can do to meet what you want and this is what I want and pay. And the other person says, this is what I want, this is what I expect, this is what I want it done and this is how I want to pay you. And you agree on it. You set the parameters and then you both understand what that agreement is. Sometimes you put it in writing and it's all lined out. But what would happen if Say someone said, well, you know, I want you to build me a house, you know, and so you go, okay, I'll build you a house. And you, you went out and you build them a log cabin and they said, well, you know, I wanted a six-story mansion. <laughs> well, obviously a log cabin isn't a six-story mansion. So implying that you understand what the other person wants is never a good thing. You should always discuss things together so that you both know where you're coming from, where you're going, and how to get there. And that's what Jesus meant when he sent them out as twos, and that's what it's like to have a Christian friend. You open up and be honest about why you want to be friends. You know, I'd like to know you in this way. You know, I'd like to grow it with you in this peculiar area or particular area. I'd like to make a commitment with you. Now, some people put a lot of pressure on their marriage by thinking that God gave their wife to them so that they could make them into their BFF, you know, or they're going to make them into that oneness that Jesus had with the Father. <laughs> well, okay. Good luck. That's all I can tell you. I don't see it that way. You know, with Adam and Eve, you know, no offense, I don't see necessarily that kind of relationship in Someday I'll probably talk about marriage and relationships and what I think that wives and husbands are and how God uniquely designed them to be. And I don't think it's always for being in one accord. I think it's purposely designed to not be in accord. But that's a whole different lesson. But in choosing a friend, it's someone that you want to develop that personal discipleship with. You want to become more than a follower. You want to disciple and to confess your fault to, to admit failure and success with, and then do things together, to accomplish things in the ministry together. Then, gathered together in my name, bound by a common loyalty to me, desirous only of doing my will for both of you, then, when this is so, I am present also, a self-invited guest. And when I am there, one with you, voicing the same petition, 
and making your demands mine, then it follows that the request is granted. But what man has failed perhaps to realize is all that lies behind these words. For two to agree about the wisdom of a request, to be certain it should be granted and will be granted if it should be, is not the same as two agreeing that a prayer request should be made. In other words, a lot of times in determining a direction and deciding what to pray, when you get two people to agree, it's not just simply, oh, well, let's just both pray and agree on it. But you should take the time to really think about, to ask God, and to see whether or not it's something that's according to His will, according to His word, and according to His way. There's three different aspects there, because, you see, God's will, the Father, is such that salvation is a priority, and He wants to bring that salvation of His Son to the world. And he chooses lots of times to use lots of different ways to bring that about. When a non-Christian comes to me and says, Hey, you know what? I need prayer for, you know, healing because I got cancer. And I ask him, well, do you know Jesus? Nope. Well, I don't know how to tell you this, but I don't know that I can pray for you to be healed. To be blunt. I don't know that God might not be using cancer to get your attention. And so, I don't resist praying for them, but I ask God first, Lord, do you want me to pray for this person who doesn't know you to be healed of cancer, that you might use that to talk to them about salvation? So, there are certain circumstances where the obvious answer isn't what you think it is. The obvious answer is what the will of the Father is. And then, in knowing His will, in knowing His word, the second step is to know whether or not we are praying according to scriptural reasons. For instance, if a person says, hey, you know, I want you to pray for my girlfriend. You know, we're living together and, you know, she just doesn't get it, but we have to stay together. Well, the word kind of says, except to agree, how shall they walk together? So. It's kind of hard to pray for something like that, that's contrary to his word. So, if the will of the Father and the word both agree, then you're heading in the right direction about praying for something. But lastly, in his way, what is Jesus wanting to accomplish in this prayer request? Because you see, there's a lot that Jesus had to say. And if you don't know what Jesus said in a lot of the Sermon on the Mount or other things, then you might be praying for things you probably shouldn't be praying for. Like, sometimes people pray, well, you know, God, I really want to kill my enemies. That's not what Jesus wanted, you know. Well, God, I just really want to, you know, you know, I wish you would take the poor away, you know, and hide them someplace. Well, that's not really what Jesus wanted. So you see, there's three aspects of praying according to his will, his word, and his way. And when those are in agreement, and then you agree with your, your Christian friend, then you have what you want. It's not just simply an idea that you can take this theological premise and say, oh, well, of course, you know, we agree because it's going to work out best. We think it's the best thing for them. So, obviously, because we agree, we're going to get it. No. No, 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 no. Agreement was more than that. And that's what it meant by in his will, in his way, and in his word. You really need to take the time, if you want that expectation that it will happen, to know what his will is in the situation, know what the word is in the circumstances, and know what his way is in what will be accomplished. And when you do that, then you can have confidence in knowing that what you pray will happen. Me personally, yeah, I take the time. I, I stop, I look, I listen, I wait, I consider, I ponder, sometimes research, and then I have the expectation that everything I pray for, God does. I tell people that. I get everything I pray for. <laughs> to me, it's like, well, of course. 
I'm talking to God, so I only pray what he wants me to pray. So when we pray, I agree with him. I don't tell him something he doesn't agree with. I tell him to have his way <laughs> and let me follow into it. <laughs> I get everything I want. <laughs> Pretty simple that way. So, in a world that wants to be supernatural and super silly about it, that wants to get caught up in Satan or caught up in supernatural or pagan, meaning like witchcraft or some earthy superstition, really, um, or a false religion or false ideas like voodoo or undead or you know, all these off ideas that tantalize the emotions, it's always good to have a friend that you can share and talk to and care for and care with. Because when you do, you'll find that between you and him or her and Jesus, you will know what his will is for you.